At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the 1st century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and dangerous this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. Number 7. Daily Acts In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants' nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as daily acts at this point, or acta diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See, these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it, these were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? Ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. It took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the first triumvirate, Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red, moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival, Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter, Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis, political differences. Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Ah, fairly well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. Number five, basket of bees. Guess what this one is? 
It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the Dark Ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows, I don't know. History gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, eh, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? Number four, the Colosseum. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know. That's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge. It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a 10th lays discovered with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic, 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kinda. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103. BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property 
and lesser people. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to go back in time and visit ancient Rome. I'm sure there was a lot in ancient Rome that people would want to see and experience for themselves, so let me know your thoughts down in the comments. Number 10, Desmond Viri, The Law of 12 Tables. Well, actually the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the Law of 12 Tables. A commission of 10 men, or also known as the Decemviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place, holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mayhu, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kind of got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kind of sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers, didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them Stone Cold Steve Austining the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey. You got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Guess I could just like make a wall. And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. At number seven, ownership. In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number six, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf 
and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number 5, Demand In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job, and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number 4, Procurement The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tums to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before tums. See, what you would do is you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go and then put it back and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster because, hey, now you made room. Number two, gladiators. If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then you absolutely nailed it because that's pretty well it. A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the gladiator games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're... Your... Okay, you're Spartacus. Spart okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the gladiator, though living just to their mid-20s. I mean, it was, it's pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy, which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from eight to 10 fights in their whole career. Come on, dude, 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of like Spartacus, just 
Yeah, that's nice. I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once thriving city of Pompeii. We found a snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time, it was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? 